own words. Um, well, thank you, Mark. And I will take as much flattery as anyone is willing to give. Um, we are, you're right, we are typically up to a lot. Um, this weekend in particular, we are hosting a Juneteenth celebration in collaboration with um, Kai Kai Heritage Center, Spectacular Magazine. And when I say we, I belong to a lot of different institutions. So this time around, this we is referencing Village of Wisdom, which is a nonprofit that supports black families in advocating for their children in closing the academic achievement gap. Yeah, and they've done a lot of great work in that regard because, I mean, I've just, that's actually, I was watching just before we started doing the show, I was watching a little bit of one of the past city council meetings. I believe it was the one the last week, and that's one of the things that Virginia Peterson was talking about was the academic gap and just some of the ways that there's a gap, even in the way that the uh, groups are supported because she was feeling that the African-American youths were not getting as much love as some of the newer blood that is coming here into Durham has been getting recently, and she was being very adamant in some of her conversations, but that's just kind of the way Virginia has always been, and I don't think she'll ever change being that way, and we need people like her out in the community, but you have also done a good job of trying to encourage people to understand that we need to understand our history, but also uh, put it into the context of more modern-day times as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, what you'll experience at this Juneteenth event is, number one, is collaboration. We are going to be collaborating with Spectacular Magazine. We are not trying to supplant an existing 15-year tradition of Boom Team with Spectacular Magazine that happens downtown on East Main. Uh, we are collaborating with them. So we are bringing the community from Northeast Central Durham, Haytai neighborhood, and we are going to be parading across Highway 147, symbolically reconnecting the Haytai neighborhood back downtown to our economic center of Black Wall Street. So we will be connecting there, and we will also be connecting with Cary. Uh, Cary is having their very first Juneteenth celebration, and we are supporting them. We're going to have um, a simultaneous drum call. You know, the djembe is the original cell phone, okay, traveling and carrying messages long distance. And so we are going to be uh, making a call between Durham and Cary at 10 a.m. So we're really inviting folks to come on down to the Haytai. We will be burying our Juneteenth time capsule. And what that is is we are launching our collective vision for black liberation into the Afro future for our uh, 2050 generation, future generation to receive. So in 30 years, we will open that time capsule. And do we have any idea what's in that time capsule yet? I uh, know that you've probably been collecting a lot of different things, but do we have any idea what's in the time capsule and what folks can expect to see when they open it uh, some 30 years later? Yes, um, there are lots of renditions of what black liberation looks like, um, things that folks are envisioning for the future, but the ways in which uh, our struggle for black liberation has been embodied by um, you know, different artifacts of that. So I saw some incense in there. I saw some pictures of family in there. I saw um, letters to people. In fact, one of the things we have done is we have invited black leadership of black institutions here in Durham to write a letter to the future, meaning a letter to the future ED of your organization. Or ask, we've even asked the mayor to write a letter to the future mayor of Durham, what would you say to this future mayor? Who do you think that that person would be? And so we're collectively envisioning our future, but we're also sending um, hopes. We're sending some instructions. We're sending some warnings. Um, so I'm really excited by all that our future is going to receive from us um, in 2050. And just out of curiosity, what do you think the future is going to look like uh, if you were to put out your own letter, and you, you may even have a letter in there, but if you were to just jump out in the future and say, this is what Durham is going to look like in 2040 and 2050. We know some of the concerns because some people are concerned about, like I've mentioned before, gentrification, what our youth are doing, things of that nature. But what do you see? And also, Telly, if you want to jump in as well, what do you see as the future of Durham some 20 or 30 so, 20, 30, 40 years from now, or even just the future of the country in general? Because I mean, we hear a lot of talk about the way that uh, different segments of society are communicating with each other based on who's in 
currently occupying offices in the White House. We don't like to mention his name. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of people have ideas on 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 the negative things that are going to be um, that are going to be impactful in the future. But <clears throat> I prefer to spend most of our time thinking about the positive things. When I look at the youth today, you know, a lot of people see the trouble, but I, but I, you know, my part of my work is is creating the change in the youth. Part of my work is to is to uplift the, the future generations, and so I actually see, I actually see this work being fruitful. I see the fruits of this labor in the future. I see some powerful young people with some powerful determination and some beautiful positivity in their hearts who have the strength to to take on whatever challenges are, are confronted we're confronted by in the future. Oh, and I, I, I agree with you. These children, and it makes me feel really good. And I agree with you, uh, Telly, because I'm just even thinking about uh, some of the things that I just saw this weekend. I mean, when I saw those kids at the uh, performance that, that St. Sia Academy did as part of their graduation ceremony, which was a wonderful play that was kind of based on the Harlem Renaissance and everything, or even when I was mentioning before y'all called in that we had, um, me and me and Captain Newborn and others had gone down to Roxborough to do our road to the Apollo, and we had a number of kids that were performing, kids that were under the age of 18 and everything, and just seeing the amount of energy and uh, positive energy that they were putting out there and was totally counter to the stereotype that we're getting from the media. I mean, even the group that was kind of a dance step kind of group and everything, and these were young ladies between the ages of 9 and 17, they just like just totally were amazing the way that they were doing these coordinated steps. And like I said, I was just totally blown away with some of the performances that St. Sia Academy has done. And I know that uh, Ms. Davis has done a good job of encouraging that within her school and that she's now had for a number of years. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I, I, I see this, I see this, this growing. I see this growing, and I and and I can only imagine what it's going to be like thirty years from now, in the future. Uh, when we, when, you know, when those of us who are who are coming up in age can be actually secure in the fact that we can sit down, we can sit back and allow these young people to to, to take the helm, to take the reins. Um, I, you know, I'm not worried about the future. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the things that I'm telling you, you might be able to elaborate on this. And I think you've traveled there as well, um, Aya and everything. But um, that's one of the things that I think we miss sometimes from our uh, homeland country and everything. Because, like I said, I know that you still have your dad living, I believe it's in Ghana and everything. But there seems to be a lot more generational dialogue, for lack of a better term, and also generational respect. Because I know sometimes even here we seem to get caught up in each generation not wanted to, the young generation maybe not wanted to listen to the older generation, but also vice versa. The older generation not wanted to listen to the young generation, but it seems to me that the best societies are those where everybody respects each other. And I think that we definitely had that when Baba Chuck was living because he always encouraged that. But it seems to me that that is something that sometimes we have to fight against that kind of notion that we don't do enough of that. Would you agree with that? And that's because that's something that I always see y'all encouraging in everything y'all do, whether it's Kwanzaa, whether it's the Juneteenth celebration, whether it's the walk-in tours that you do. I, it's uh, you're very much about encouraging that everybody dialogue, and not just in our own community, but you also have share a lot with other people of other ethnicities. I mean, you've even shared some of our history with people of Asian American heritage and of European heritage and things of that nature, but just so they don't just come into a city blind and think that they're not part of a greater story. Absolutely. Um, one of the reasons why and I started Whistle Stop, and Whistle Stop um, will be present at this Juneteenth celebration. They are going to be our storytellers using performance to enliven the history. But one of the reasons why I started Whistle Stop was because um, I really wanted to tell our story, but realized that this story belongs to all of us, depending on when we get here. And so I came in 20, 2003, and so my take on the neighborhood is different than somebody who grew up here in 1963. Um, and so I'm always inviting people to share their story and grapple with Haiti's story in particular, but all of Black Durham's history 
it's um, um, we are changing um, Durham by our presence, and so we need to be um, changing the community built on a foundation um, of what came before. So we're not coming here doing anything new. We're building on what our forefathers and foremothers have made as a foundation, which, which is why I really stress really having a strong historical understanding of neighborhoods, and not just from the book, right? The books are written with a particular narrative, but talking to existing neighbors um, and hearing their perspectives, it takes all of us to tell the whole story. No, no doubt about that. And uh, just out of curiosity, I've always wondered this. What was your initial perception of Durham when you first moved here, and how has that changed to now? Because like I said, I remember when you first moved here into the area, I want to say I might have even been at the Arts Council at that time because I want to say that it was Baba Chuck that brought you here. And then, of course, as you've been here for a while, you then also discovered your husband here as well. So um, what was your initial perception of this lovely city when you came here from the north? Because I believe you came from the northern area, if I remember correctly. For some reason, Boston is coming to my mind, but correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I'll correct you. It's Cambridge. It's nearby, but it's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I did come here to dance with Baba Chuck Davis and the African American Dance Ensemble. And mind you, I was, you know, about 15 years younger. So how I saw things was very different um, than how I see things now. I mean, now my children are born here, and so what I pay attention to is based on my role as a parent. Um, uh, you know, now that I'm older, I'm building institutions. You know, I'm part of founding of school, Empowered Minds Academy. Um, but when I first came here, um, you know, uh, it was a new city, and I loved who I met. It was about who was here, and Durham has some amazing people. I go downtown now, and I see lots of newcomers with the word Durham on their shirt, Durham this and Durham that, and, and I'm glad that there's this Durham pride. But when I came here, it was the people who made Durham. And so um, I'm, I'm wondering if there is a difference. But I met some wonderful storytellers like Brian Mamoywa and um, um, Mama Beverly from the North Carolina Black Storytellers, um, Baba Chuck Davis, you, Mark. I really was invested, Thomas I. McDonald. I was so invested in the people and the stories that people told. Um, I could see the hate high that people were referencing, even though I couldn't see it with my my natural eye, but through the stories. And so I was, uh, I really wanted to bring back uh, that heyday, that pride. I, and I know people still have it, but when I looked around when I first got here, I didn't see, I couldn't see it on the street. You know, I couldn't look around and see the mutual or the economic wealth or those pieces. And um, But I, I am really excited about the renaissance that's happening on Black Wall Street with Empower Dance and Complex Design and uh, Durham Dental and Zen Succulent and all of these black businesses, Mark Simeon and his law firm, like all of these uh, black businesses who are investing in our history and taking it forward. I am so pleased to be a part of that. Yeah, definitely. And uh, Telly, what was your reaction when you first came here? Because your family has some deep roots to North Carolina and everything. I mean, if I remember correctly, y'all have a whole performance thing, but then you also have the roots back to the homeland and everything. So just share a little bit about your own history as well. Okay. Well, um, you know, I was born in Liberia in West Africa. My parents left in the 60s and moved to Africa with no intention of coming back. But as, you know, life would have it, things changed, um, wars happened, and um, we wound up back in the United States. When um, when I moved to when we moved to Durham, we were um, the first time I visited Durham was in 1995, and and even when we moved to North Carolina, it was I, you know we lived in Raleigh in the Raleigh area, and I didn't really know Durham that much. All I knew was Haiti. Whenever somebody mentioned Durham, all I all I thought about was the Haiti. So when we came to Durham, the Haiti and the co-op were the two main places that we went to, and we spent time there, and we taught there, and uh, we worked there, and we we built and grew and and danced and drummed, and uh, and worked with the youth there. So um, 